There are seasons in your life where you come into a reality that what you went through is leaving you, but, but Ruth still had to make a decision once she got to Bethlehem to go into the fields and begin to glean. Did you see that in chapter 2, verse 3? She went into the field and began to glean. It says that she started gleaning, but it doesn't say that she ceased grieving. The first thing I want to talk to you about that might be like a point <laughs> is gleaning in the grieving. Put it right in the chat. Gleaning in the grieving. Because what we think is going to happen is that when our harvest comes of what we ask God for, how many times do you think they prayed, God, bring bread to Bethlehem? What they didn't know is that when the bread came back to Bethlehem, they would also be bringing their bitterness with them. Gleaning in the grieving. We think, God's going to bless me, and I'm going to feel better. That's how I'll know I'm blessed. Because gleaning, gleaning is like, I don't think any of us know that much about gleaning, so let me try to explain it. But my agricultural knowledge is very low. But from the biblical perspective, they would go through the field, and it was, it was actually required by Levitical law. And you can check this out in Leviticus 19, because I know you've been looking for an excuse to dive into the book of Leviticus. So you could go to the 19th chapter of the book of Leviticus. And read about how they commanded them in the law. They said, when you're gathering your crops, the wealthy landowners, you have to leave a little on the edges. And if you don't pick something through the first time, you don't get to go back through and pick it up again. That's for the gleaners. Who are these gleaners? The gleaners consist of three categories. It's the destitute or the poor. It is the widows, and it is the foreigners. Ruth is all three. She is uniquely qualified through her disadvantages to go through the field and glean. So we keep, we keep thinking it takes stuff that it really doesn't take for God to provide for us. You know, our educational level. But, but, but if you're good at gleaning, it doesn't mean that you have stopped grieving. There is no indication. I defy you to find it in the text. You can seek, and you won't find. Where Ruth danced, and Naomi high-fived her. You won't find anything in the text that suggests that the sadness ceased. But the bread was there, but so was the bitterness. That's why I told you last week, almost as a warning, it will come together. The biggest blessing of your life might come at the worst time. You can have a great blessing at a horrible time. Truly, surely. You don't believe me? Have some kids. I mean, they're a blessing from the Lord, right? But they will walk in and want to talk to you at the worst times. They never come talk to you after you wrote in your journal this morning and prayed to Jesus and asked the Lord, God, give me an opportunity today to speak wisdom into the next generation. God, I just want to train up my children in the way that they should go. It's going to be when you are tripping over something that was on your schedule that day that you are going to have the opportunity to glean. Watch this. Glean doesn't mean the field is full and you just go through picking. Glean means that you notice what was left on the ground that somebody else didn't even see. So, pop quiz. Are you good at gleaning? On a scale of one to ten, how good are you at gleaning? What do you mean, preacher? I mean, how good are you at taking a regret in your life? And by the Spirit of God turning it into a lesson and recognizing it maybe as the hand of God, even though you don't call it that. 
Are you good at that? Because I am not a graduate level gleaner. Truth be told, God is teaching me to glean every single day. And I just started back two weeks ago doing my gratitude journal again. I stand up here about once a year and I say, Y'all keep a gratitude journal. I do it for two weeks. And then I forget to glean. And so what usually has to happen to me is I have to get to a point of so much anxiety in my life and so much worrying about stuff that's stupid and doesn't matter. And so much of being mad about stuff that you know other people said or did or didn't say or didn't do or gonna do maybe do hypothetically do in the future at some point that I'm trying to you know sitting there all tied up in knots about things I'm going through. And so I just started back to practice a few weeks ago. I have got to start my day with caffeine because I can't glean without caffeine. It came to me on the spot. I just went with it. <laughs> I love y'all so much. But the, but the thing about that is it causes me to go back through my day and see what things I got to do that I thought I had to do. And I need that constant training. I can't just do that once a week. Maybe you get all you need of that on Sunday. You know, Once a week, I come and I worship God, and I thank him for all he's done. I can't do it six days without him. I can't. Because if I do, grief will overtake gleaning. You, you don't live to be 42 and, and not have tears in the fiber of your faith. You, know, you don't pastor a church that just grows and grows and not lose a lot along the way. You don't believe with, with faith and expectation. I know you know what I'm talking about. You don't live this long and not have some grief. The thing that really arrested my attention, and I hope you see it. I don't know if you, if, if you look for it, you'll see it in the text that it doesn't say that they stopped grieving in order to start gleaning. And I want to set you free that you might not feel better yet. That has nothing to do with God's hand on you or not. When it said, I love this, I love this. It said there was a man named Boaz on their side. They didn't know that yet. Read it in the text. It says they had a relative named Boaz. Naomi knew about Boaz. She didn't know he was still around. They had no idea, and neither do you, my friend. So you cannot let the grief overtake the gleaning because there is still something left on your life. There is still something left in your life. The process of gleaning, I mean, you got to go through the field. You've got to learn how to not only go through somebody else's field, but go through your own field and see what's on the ground. That's what the gleaners would do. They would, they would follow behind. You could either follow at a distance. Or if you got special permission, you could glean among the sheaves. That means you could get close. You could get more than six feet close to the sheaves, and whatever fell out, you could grab that too. And they didn't have the permission to lay a hand on you because you were gleaning among the sheaves. And that means you get to stay close to the reaper. And that's what Ruth wanted. She said, I want to glean behind the reapers, among the sheaves, and just let me see what they miss, because I can live on what they miss. You will meet somebody every once in a while that is so good at gleaning, it'll make you feel guilty over how grumpy and gripey and ridiculous you are. Speaking from personal experience, I meet people all the time going through things that would grieve me so much cuz i know how I, I know my tolerance level you know people say i have a high pain tolerance that's a sign they don't right <laughs> true story chunks used to be a physical therapist he said when you hear somebody come and say i have a high pain tolerance they are a wimp that is sign number 1 cuz they're deceived they think they have a high pain tolerance 
But when you meet somebody who truly, who truly gleans while grieving, like when Layman texted me this week and he was like, Oh, thank you for that word. How do you lose your son while you're in church? That's been how many years? About a decade. About 10 years. About the same amount where Naomi had lost Elimelech. I know he's still grieving. How can he be grateful to a God who let his son be taken so soon? He never stopped grieving. He just started gleaning. His son loved to fish, so he started a fishing club in his son's honor. The only people they bring to Christ through Riley's Catch. Look it up, Riley's Catch. You'll see it. Shout out. Free advertisement, Tom Lehman. Thank you. You're welcome. I always text him, You're my favorite layman. Like the play on words, layman and clergy. Ha ha ha. Because he teaches me to glean. Going through my own life, just recognize that's the thing about gleaning, okay? Because I want you to know that somebody else could walk through the field of your life and find 10 things to be grateful for that you take for granted. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. Trust me, God gave me this message early last week and he whipped me with it all week. Just over and over again. I, I was listing a bunch of things to Holly that I was stressed about this week. All of them were things that I put on my own schedule. All of them were decisions I made. Many of them were blessings that I prayed for. Just full grown. They're not puppies anymore. Because you know, a scheduling commitment is a puppy. But when the appointment comes, it's a full grown dog and it has to be walked. By the way, Graham said he's naming his dog apparently this Boston Terrier Boaz. So that's good. That's good. That's good. It's, it's going to take a while. It's going to take a while. Even, even when he was begging me for a dog, if you missed it last week, it was a whole thing. Don't worry about it. But even when, when he used to ask me for a dog, he said, All you do is bring up all the things about the dog that we're going to hate. And I said, That's right. And all you do is think of all of the things with the dog that you're going to love. And I'm accurate. And you're ignorant. But sometimes you can know too much. Sometimes you can know too much to where you get in a point where you stop looking for the Lord. Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Now, when you name yourself bitter, Mara. You become magnetic for Mara. So the second thing that's kind of like a point in this message is the mind on a mission. The mind on a mission. The mind on a mission. That's where I told Elijah the other day. He was going on and on and just complaining. And I said, son, is your mind just on a mission trip to be miserable today? Did you just wake up this morning and say, uh, here, dear mind, here's what I'd like for you to do to me, for me today. You fascinating computer called the human brain. I want you to collect everything that I can be stressed about and sad about today and put it all in one big pile. I am gleaning everything today that I can feel terrible about. I don't want any good thoughts. I don't want any grateful thoughts. I'm going straight to Misery Incorporated. Call me Mara. And I asked him that. I said, did you just wake up today and tell your mind, we're going on a mission today. We are going to find misery. Wherever we can find it, we will nurture it in its various forms. If we see potential misery, we will, we will feed it. We will nurse it at our breast until it becomes full-grown misery. We will look for offense, and we will nurse it at our bosom until it becomes full-grown resentment, until it takes over, and we are depressed at the end of the day, praying for God to give us peace. Hey, thank you for watching. Make sure you subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream, and share this video with a friend. And don't forget, you can join me live every Sunday. Thanks again for watching.